Hi there, I'm glad you're here. We are done with the theory, let's get our hands on this project and this episode is all about this guy here, the keyboard. It's 12 degrees Celsius right now, so I'm be moving and speaking slowly, but I'm here to show you what I've done already with this project. How I first identified the pins and then tested and then discovered that the pins were kind of old and they needed a little bit of cleaning. And then I tried to clean two times. The first one I ruined it and I'm going to show you what not to do. And then I'm going to show you how to make a connector to use on a breadboard and later on a board. Let's do it. So just to show my arsenal, I got two Roland's U20 and this keyboard here, I think, is from a Roland Juno D, I, I suppose because I just got the keyboard. This video will be divided in four parts and they are. First I'm going to show you how to clean and how not to clean a keyboard and then show you two videos that go in depth, full detail about how to do it. In the second part, I'm going to show you a technique that I created, uh, pro probably not new, but it's a technique that I found out was really good to use conductive paint to restore the tabs. In the third part, I'm going to show you how I identify the pins, of course using another link, another tutorial that I'm going to link in the description as always, and how I organized this spreadsheet to use after later on with the software. And then the fourth and last part, how I'm going to read the keyboard and identify the timings, and then how I created a model to simulate all the resistances and parasite resistances of the keyboard to just get the best performance out of it. Then in the next video is all about the softer part of the keyboard and all the things you need to do to get all the inputs available. So let's get going. So welcome to the second cam. Yes, it's the crappy old one I'm using. And I want you guys to focus on the keyboard right now and to this big old here, camera here. The two videos in the description are by Marcus Fuller and Brad THX. Very fitting last name, if that's your last name. Of course, it's in the internet. And I'm gonna show you, after you watch those two videos, this is just a big roundup, you know, big rundown of all the process. And that's basically, let me show you, these are the keys already removed, but you have some springs. Remove the springs, it's really easy. You can use pliers or your own fingers, not a problem. And we just put it right here, where you focus. Here are the springs and the keys. The keys, remember, you have to remove the whites first. A very dangerous sentence. They're gonna fit like this. You gotta first put the back part so it is, enters there. That's a little space. And after that, gets in the fulcrum. And then the spring, you make this, all right? So always lift this, the tip and pull back. That's how you go back. You'll be facing these rubber pads, this rubber tab, I don't know how they call this, this membrane, and you're gonna just pull it. it, it comes back, you see? You see? It comes back. And this is everything that it takes for the keyboard to identify your press. It has two rubber pads there, they will touch these contacts, and then, just like old calculators, and calculators to this day use this system, they are very, this is very practical, you make a contact because these rubber pads are imbued with conductive paint. Problem is, dirt can get under the rubber pads and these contacts can oxidize over time, so that's another problem. And third, this conductive paint in the rubber pads can get, I don't know, old? It's weird to explain, but it dries up uh, too much, it loses conductivity. I don't know how to explain, I just know how to fix. So first, we start by cleaning it. We expose everything. Of course, I'm just just this section because, as I'll explain to you later on, this section is still bad. It has problems, so I'll clean it with you. And all you're gonna need is some Q-tips and isopropanol or isopropylic alcohol, as it's called here in Brazil. So all you gotta do, a little bit of isopropanol, and a little bit. I mean, you can just put it in there. There's not a problem. This dries really fast, as an alcohol does. And you get a Q-tip right now, and just... Rub it until you see all the dirt removed. And as you can see, the focus here is not ideal, but you can see some dirt in there. That is a big problem. It can be dust, 
can be some fungi from Yugoth, I don't know. Just rub it all up. After some time, change the tip and keep on going. The idea here is to expose the bare metal up for the rubber contacts to work like a switch. Otherwise that oxidation or something here, it would prevent it from happening. So right now they are really shiny and metallic. All you gotta do is to wait it to dry, but you can just, you know, blow it with a hair dryer if you're impatient and hyperactive as I am. So two things really important here. First, do not touch again with your fingers. You have acids and fats in your skin and that can help corrode the contacts. And second, do not apply isopropanol after you use the conductive painting because it can wash the painting away. So now everything is clean and dry, we can move to the next part and it is to restore the pads. So I changed the configuration a little bit of the camera because now I need to be brighter. But you just see these rubber pads, they are dark gray, the color of graphite. So it gives you a little hint about how the conductive paints work. And we're basically going to use, let me show you in the big camera. This is Buddy Paint Hong Hai Wing Wing Wing. I don't know how to speak Chinese, but the important part here is this is the cheapest conductive paint I could get in Brazil. It was not cheap cheap, but it was the cheapest option. And it worked for the rest of the keyboard. But this first part here, this first octave has some problems because I am stupid and I followed a tip by a guy on the internet. He said that you could glue a little bit of foil in the contacts so they work perfectly. And that is the worst tip ever. Do not do that. Use conductive paint. Do not glue anything to the pads. That was stupid and I learned my lesson the hard way. Now I have some malfunctioning keys. So first, you should remove this, alright? You should remove these guys and use on a table. I'm gonna do it here because just some keys, not all of them, but go systematic, okay? If you find a whole octave that has a problem, you apply this to the whole octave and let it dry. So for this first guy here, you probably can't see, of course I don't have the best camera in the world for that, but it's a little bit rough, a little bit damaged by the glue, of course. So shake this because it has a really powerful solvent in here. And then arrest the pads and apply the conductive paint. You see it's wet right now? Conductive paint, come on. There you go. Now there is this halo of conductive paint on the pads and there will be a little problem. Why? Because it will dry and form this halo around it of dry paint. You gotta remove that and clean because it is small pieces in, of conductive dirt, conductive pieces, get under the pads. They can cause an always on situation on a key and you don't want that on a synthesizer, right? So after applying this, take care of the drying process, all right? Let it dry fully, fully dry. And after that, you gotta remove the excess. So it, some crumbs of conductive paint can't get under the pads and make an always on situation, all right? So I'm gonna redo the process for this last three keys. These guys here need a little bit more conductive paint. There you go. You can, you can use paint in excess because it will dry and it's, it's easy to clean, so no worries. And that's it, you apply conductive paint. Let's just apply a little bit more because this is the first octave, right? And at least to me, is my favorite part in synths, is the bass one. Remember I told you to wait for the alcohol, the, the isopropanol to dry completely. And this is way more important now because this conductive paint cannot touch the pads. Otherwise you're gonna make a, a, a jumper. You're gonna, you're gonna glue the, the switches always on. So wait for it to dry completely. It needs to be fully dry. For then, you know, you remove the halo of dry parts, 
So just a rubber pad has conductive paint. And after that, then you can put the rubber pad back on and the keys and, and go for the next part, okay? So don't forget to wait for it to dry completely. It needs to be fully dry because this can ruin your day if you're applying the wrong way. It even rhymes. So uh, I waited for it to dry. It took me some time. So you can see here in the parts that I apply the conductive paint, there is a little bit of a, a crown, a halo. You see there? And that's the problem. You're gonna clean that because while you're pressing, it can break and then go below the key and create a permanent contact. And that's really bad and really hard to debug because you think it's our software, you think it's our control circuit, and that's not. So let's just clean that a little bit and move on to the third part to identify the control pins. And you can see uh, how this crown was formed. I basically waited for it to dry, put it back into the pad and pressed it a little bit. So it kind of helps it to release from the pad. And you should be very gentle while you're doing this because if it, this little crown breaks into crumbs, it'll be way harder to clean. So I think this is good enough. We have to test it. So I'll put it back into place and go for the third part, identifying the pin. So now that we have a trustworthy keyboard and we assume all the keys work, we go to this connector here and we try to identify what is what in here. But first it's important to understand what a key matrix is, also called sometimes scan matrix. So you can type scan matrix keyboard on Google and you find the Wikipedia actually is not that helpful. I found this Open Music Labs article about how matrix work and and this site actually has everything you need to know basically it's easier for us to read for a microcontroller a matrix of keys than just reading them one key for each gpio of the microcontroller because that would be we have here 61 keys on this keyboard and we have double the switches it will be actually double 61 so 122 because each key is two switches so harder you press your key, the shorter the time between the clicks. So the microcontroller can read one, wait for the second key to click, and then you know you pressed hard or soft. It depends on the timing. And it would be stupid to use 122 GPIOs just to read a keyboard. So what happens in humanity in all its brilliance created the switch matrix, sometimes called the scan matrix. And basically is you have columns and rows and you power one of them, read the other. And that's basically it. There are diodes there to prevent ghosting and you can read that on the Wikipedia page, but you can just ignore all this and just imagine a matrix with columns and rows. You power a column or a row depends on the direction the diode was soldered in. So in this case here, in this schematic, you'll be powering the row and then reading the column. It depends on the direction the, di the diode is put in the schematic. So it's important for you when you're gonna test your keyboard to just switch your multimeter because you may be testing the right key and the right combination of pins, but in the wrong direction. So every time you test your pins, switch the multimeter. And you may be asking, how do I test the pins, the connector? How do I discover what is what? So I put in the description a link to a really nice article by Structable how to read a scan matrix and it's all there I won't do a better job because I read that and then learned from that so I have already a connector here that identified the pins and I can show you what happens next so I tested the connector over and over and I found this pattern it may look a little bit complicated but you can relax I'll show you every part of it. It's important to organize this because this will later translate to a code. You can imagine like if I power the GPIO X and I read the GPIO Epsilon, what key is that? So it's important to be really organized. I kind of overdid this, but let me show you. Here is the indication I uh, made in this indication is basically the red part of the connector. So the indication that is the first, you know, then you have the rows. Remember I told you the rows? 
you have the diode directions. So, so I tested with a multimeter and I found that these are the row connections and these are the columns. The last one is dead, so there is nothing there. And it's important to start by the, the marker because sometimes the manufacturer leaves some connectors open or unused. And here I marked the edge, X for the primary. You saw a P and an S in the connector. The, the primary is the first switch that is pressed when you press a key. And epsilon, the secondary, is the later one. So you measure the time between two and you can detect, kind of detect, how hard the musician pressed the key. I marked this weak here because I detect that some keys are kind of weak. So what happens, the resistance was a little bit higher than expected. So I lowered my detection threshold. I showed that in the circuit part. So just keep that in mind that this W was a sign for me, not for you. Here I made indication that these guys had a problem. So I applied more conductive painting. And basically for each key, I identified what column I was using to read and what row I was powering. And this is the final result. And yes, I had to use Greek letters because basically I'm using the normal letters for music notes. So C, D, E, F, G, and then you have A and B again. And I don't know the names of the notes. I use this since I started studying music and that's how I do it. So with this schematic, I know exactly what pin to power and what pin to read for each key of the keyboard and personally I think it's gonna be like one of the hardest part because it's just a, a brain dead job you know you have to test every single pin once you find the panner everything is done then you write it down and it's easier for you when you write in the software to know what to look for so to end this already really really long video I will show you the modeling that I did so I created a model to try to understand how are the resistance and parasite resistance in this keyboard. So first I'm gonna use a multiplexer that I already have in my hands and you can see here I made this board to multiplex the reading of the keyboard. So I use even less pins than eight by 16. So the multiplexer resistance is 225 because it's three multiplexers. I will explain this in the electronics part. So next video. Then the diode that I suppose is a 4148. So I use this because it's really common diode. And here you can see the voltage levels I got when I use these two loads in here. This is to be the same key. And I use a 1K resistor and a 10 resistor. And with a 10K resistor, I got higher levels. So I, I imagine that an open key had a parallel resistance. So I model that and based on these results, I calculate the values of this parallel resistor and series resistor. The series, of course, is really low as expected, but the parallel one is really low and I didn't expect that. That's why you, you have a really high voltage with an open key. And this, of course, using 3.3, you can use 5. So this experiment here is really important because later on I will design an electronic circuit to read these values and you can see using 5 or 3.3 we have different voltages here but we have similar results for closed key really high voltage but the open key you have a really high voltage using a higher loads so what I decided was to use a lower load so 1k resistor in series with the keyboard itself because my circuit you have a comparator you know I have an op amp comparing the signal and then outputting a really digital signal so I don't have to worry about some analog values you know because everything here is really analog when you stop to think about it you know the rubber pads and the contacts and you don't need to understand all of this this modeling because later on I will show you the circuit that I designed and it works you can just copy the circuit and move on so basically what I decided was every time my multiplexer read a key I compare to this value here and it's basically a diode in series of resistor. So the 0.6 is really good, is between the 0.3 and the 3.5. And if I decide to switch to 3.3 readings, I still have 0.2 and 2. So the diode voltage is really safe here to play. And one kilo ohm resistor is a really good load to read from the keyboard. You might be asking, okay, what is the electronic circuit? Well, this video got already way too long and I have to edit and to put it out in the internet and wait for you guys to give me feedback and ask questions. So this video will be only for the keyboard and for the circuit and the programming of the keyboard. 
I will do it on the next video. This is a video all about the keyboard, all about the connections and cleaning and refurbishing and later on we talk all about the electronics and programming involved. Just before ending up the video I want to show you the connector I used. So you can see here you have this connector here that comes from the keyboard but I went to using the breadboard. So what did I make? Let me just adjust the focus to manual here. So this is the part you get to the keyboard connection and you can see that because manual focus. But the important part is the other side. So I basically soldered the pins and then solder other pins on the same side. This is really a pain they ask to solder but in the end the final result I think it looks really good and it just works. So to keep things from getting weird I got these two spacers here just to keep the pins on the safe side and that's basically how I use this on a breadboard and in the other board, the control board. And I think this was a really great investment to, you know, not use tons of wires and Dupont wires on the breadboard. I just before finishing the video, I just show you this is the next video. This is a control board that has multiplexers, so you use even fewer pins of the microcontroller. All the numerical details and electronics and programming, they will be in the next video about operating the keyboard. But this video will be only about the harder part of the keyboard and refurbishing and then reading really identify the connector. So guys, I hope you liked this video. I hope you liked this video in divided by parts so you can jump to what you need. As Louis Rossman say, I hope you learned something. And after this video, you should get a keyboard up and running. And now all we need to do is to show you an algorithm, a simple one, of course, to identify the keys and then to identify the timing of the keys because you have, you know, two rows. And then this is the nice part. I'm going to show you a little surprise of this project that some people may not be expecting. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys enjoyed the next video and I'll see you there. Bye bye.